How long can a pilot who has no instrument training expect to live after he flies into bad weather and loses visual contact? Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here of M0A.com and you are listening to the Instrument Pilot Podcast brought to you by our number one rated online ground school. Visit groundschoolacademy.com to check it out and learn more. Yesterday's video, we talked at length. You saw perhaps the simulation of 178 seconds. I want to take that a step further here today and dive a little bit more into it. What am I talking about when I mention 178 seconds? Well, it's actually a research report from the University of Illinois. More on that in a bit. Two bits of announcements here. First and foremost, uh, March 31st through April 5th, I hope you'll join us at Sun and Fun in Lakeland, Florida. Sun and Fun Hangar D, Hangar Delta, is where we are located. Same booth we've had for the for many, many years now. Come by, say hi. Also on that Saturday of Sun and Fun at 12 p.m., uh, none other than my good friend Stevo will be joining us over at the booth as well. So if you want to hang out with myself and Stevo, Saturday, 12 p.m. at the M0A.com booth. Uh, last announcement, March 26th at 3 p.m. Save this on your calendars. We'll be live streaming to the M0A YouTube and Facebook channels. My new recreation of the JFK Jr. accident. It was probably the first accident I ever um, really researched, dove into, created on a simulator, really went above and beyond. Uh, it, was a, it was a passion project in a way. It's now five, six years old. We are redoing it, and I'm going to present that to you live March 26th at 3 p.m. Let's dive into now 178 seconds. So the question they asked, and the question I posed at the very beginning, is how long can a pilot who has no instrument training expect to live after he flies into bad weather and loses visual contact? Researchers at the University of Illinois found out that answer to this question. They had 20 student guinea pigs, as they called them, their word, not mine, flew into simulated instrument weather and all went into graveyard spins or spirals, or they also call them roller coasters here. I don't think that's a proper term for spatial disorientation, but certainly not something I want to experience. Now, the outcome differed in only one respect the time it actually took to lose control. The interval actually ranged from as high as 480 seconds to only 20 seconds. They averaged it all out, and the time was 178 seconds, two seconds short of three minutes. Here is the fatal scenario they wrote up. The sky is overcast and the visibility is poor. That reported five mile visibility looks more like two, and you can't really judge the height of the overcast. Your altimeter says you're at 1500, but your map tells you there's local terrain as high as 1200. There might even be a tower nearby because you're not quite sure just how far off course you are, but you've flown in worse weather than this, so you press on. You find yourself unconsciously easing back on the controls just to clear those not so imaginary towers. With no warning, you are in the soup. You fight the feeling in your stomach. You swallow only to find your mouth dry. Now you realize you should have waited for better weather. That appointment was important, but not that important. Somewhere a voice is saying, you had it. It's all over. Kind of morbid stuff we're sharing here, right? You now have 178 seconds to live. Your aircraft feels on an even keel, but your compass turns slowly. You push a little rudder and add a little pressure on the controls to stop the turn, but this feels unnatural, and you return the controls to their original position. This feels better, but your compass is now turning a little faster, and your airspeed is increasing slightly. You scan your instrument panel for help, but you, what you see is you're in a bad spot. You'll break out in a few minutes, though, but you don't have a few minutes left. You now have 100 seconds to live. You glance at your altimeter and you're shocked to see it unwinding. You're already down to 1200 feet. Instinctively, you pull back on the controls, but the altimeter still unwinds. The engine is into the red and the airspeed nearly so. 
you now have 45 seconds to live. You're sweating and shaking. There must be something wrong with the controls. Pulling back only moves the airspeed indicator further into the red. You can hear the wind tearing at the aircraft. You have 10 seconds to live. Suddenly, you see the ground. The trees rush up at you. You can see the horizon if you turn your head far enough, but it's at an unusual angle. You are almost inverted. This last part always gets me. I, I don't even like reading this last part. It says you open your mouth to scream, but you have no seconds left. That's a profound um, essay, to say the least, from really uh, the University of Illinois and thus endorsed by the FAA. Uh, I think the, the graphic language here that they use um, is, is meant to do one thing. It's almost like scaring us straight in a way, right? How, how else could we uh, conceive such a thing? 178 seconds. And here's the real question I want to ask. At the, at the very beginning, we asked how long would it take for these 20 student pilots to lose complete control of an airplane flown into simulated IFR conditions in a simulator, obviously. Here's the real question I want to ask, and I talk about this a lot. Whenever we dive into the Null Report, that's the Joseph T. Null Report the AOPA Foundation puts out showing accident data, and you'll notice over the past few years, we've been relatively flat. There'll be a little dip, a little increase, but we've been flat accident-wise since about 2012, where there's a big drop, um, and, and that big drop was more economic than anything else. I, th I always ask this question, and, and I... Myself, I'm still searching for this answer, so I'd love to hear your response and any comments or, or anywhere you want to share this with us here. And it's this. How is it we're continuing to add the most advanced technology? When I say the most advanced technology, I mean, we're on to G1000 NXI. The Avidyne products are phenomenal. I mean, they are just, it doesn't matter who your loyalty is to brand wise, the technology that is coming out, Avidyne comes out with something great and it causes the entire market to have to level up their game. Garmin does something great and the entire market has to level up their game. We see the exact same thing happening on our iPads with four flight releases and amazing, amazing feature and everybody else levels up their game because of it. And I love it. That, that's, you know, capitalism in a way, right? Everybody, it's, it's competition. It's, it's how our society works. It's fantastic. Yet it doesn't answer the question, which is technology keeps getting better, more affordable, easier access to. Yet the accident rate remains the same. How does that happen? For now, my, my method of explaining it, and I don't know if this is correct or if this is just an easy argument, is you can't take the human factor out of the cockpit. And I know we're, listen, we're still struggling with self-driving cars. I don't think, I, I do believe there, there will be one day a, a pilotless aircraft. I don't believe it'll, uh, I don't know whose lifetime it'll be in. I don't want to speculate because technology moves very quickly, but we need to figure out the, the driverless car here first. So don't worry about job security or anything just yet as it comes to that. But there's still a human factor and a human element in aviation. One big focus of our online ground school, where I spend so much time with our students, is on the decision making. Listen, our online ground school, I tell everybody this, and this isn't a, isn't a promotion by any means, this is just stating the facts, that our online ground school is the longest course on the market as far as runtime goes. It is the most comprehensive course on the market, and it's it, it is meant that way on purpose because we are teaching real world flying. I'm not teaching you how to pass a written test, how to pass a check, right? I am teaching you the life skills that you need to make good decisions on the ground and in the cockpit, the decision usually to get back on to the ground. That's the hardest thing to teach. I could do a great Avidyne course and have done it. I could do a great G1000 NXI course. I could do all these things. And you could master that technology. But if you can't utilize that technology as a situational awareness tool, it's not providing any benefit. 
How is it we have the most advanced technology, but the accident rate still remains the same? That is the question I want to pose to you. That is the challenge I wish to pose to you as well. I really hope you're enjoying this entire 7700 uh, series here. We're diving into some more uh, accidents um, next week really working to put ourselves in the shoes of the pilots so we better understand what went wrong and what we can learn from these accidents and these incidents. I encourage you to join us March 26th at 3 p.m. on the M0A.com YouTube and Facebook pages. We'll be going live shortly, probably right at or shortly before 3 p.m. Eastern time so you can join us and see the recreation of the JFK Jr. accident. I just commend you and thank you for going above and beyond, for truly aspiring to be that safer, smarter pilot, for being that good pilot who is always learning. If there is anything, anything at all myself and this outstanding team here at M0A.com can do this week to help make you that safer, smarter pilot, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Have a fantastic day, guys, and most importantly, remember, that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day. We'll see you.